You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means we're back live once again here. With a little show we like to call around these parts, the option block. We missed you all on Monday. Nothing we could do. It's a federal holiday here in the U.S. I'm not a monster. I'm not a savage. I'm not going to make these guys come in and do a show on a day when the markets are closed. What kind of monster do you take me for? But hopefully you enjoyed some of the other content that's been hitting you throughout the week. Not a lot of live shows, a lot of mostly live to tape, but they're all hitting the network out there for you this week. And, of course, we're back live today. To fill your hot little hands and your heads with some options info. Reminding you, of course, if you like what you hear at this show, everything else we do on the network. And it's a whole heck of a lot. (laughs) Usually a couple of shows a day coming at you. Make sure you rate and review us wherever you do get this content. It's pretty much available everywhere. It does help new folks continue to discover the network in these crazy troubled times. We're all struggling through together. Of course, keep those questions and comments coming too, particularly for a day like today. It is Mail Block Thursday. We do love to hear from you guys. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program. Uncle Mike caught up in the mad snow drifts out in the far-flung hinterlands of St. Charles. Not sure if we're going to have Uncle Mike joining us today or not. We'll see maybe a little bit later. But we do have from the far-flung shores of these here United States where it's always dark, always stormy. It's the Giovinazzi compound on the shores of Maine where we are joined once again by the rockingest of lobsters, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com, by way of Carmen Lion Capital. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program, A. And B, how fares our friend there, the, the frozen meatball, who moved all the way across the country to Texas for some better weather, and lo and behold, man, did he step in it, sir. Um, I, <laughs> well, um, all I can say is he moved to Texas and – uh, it got, it, it got really cold. <laughs> Actually, I was in Houston 10 years ago and, uh, it snowed there for like one day and there was all kinds of, uh, car accidents. So I don't think that, I don't think they're built for cold in Texas. They clearly are not. Certainly their power plants are not built <laughs> for anything cold down there. Of course, massive rolling blackouts and outages throughout all of the South and Southwest and indeed Southeast. As the storm continues rolling along, that just goes to show you move across the country for better weather. The weather gods will come and smite you in the end. They're a vengeful bunch as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. 
All right, everybody. Welcome to the trading block. Of course, a portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading, what is lighting up our collective trading screens here on this Thursday, a little bit past noon central. Of course, a lot going on in the broad markets. So the the CEOs and everyone else, the hedge funds, having to do not quite a perp walk, but do their little dance before Congress out there today. There's a lot of folks paying attention to that all that maybe that gloom and doom coming out of them <laughs> and others perhaps seemingly weighing on the markets an unusual amount of red on the screen coming into today's show S&P is once again the goldilocks off about 0.85% so not quite a full percent but getting close to it Nasdaq as it is wont to do leading the charge this time in the wrong direction off 1.2% and the Dow off a nice round about 3 quarters of a percent or so. Of course, all this right on the screen means ball coming back in a little bit. It was just last week. It was just pretty much right after our last show last week. So not on the option block, but on volatility views where we saw VIX finally break through that 20 handle and close around 1997, 1998. So just a tick below 20, but that was enough for everyone to ring the bell. Here we go. VIX closing below 20 for the first time since all this pandemic madness happened. Here we go. It's the beginning of uh, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end, whatever you want to call it out there. This is, this marks the turning point for volatility. Of course, if you listen to volatility views, you know, we said, uh, maybe not so fast. Yeah, sure. The front portion of the curve is looking nice and nice and soft, but you go a little bit farther out in VIX futures territory, they're pricing in a whole heck of a lot more volatility, which means they probably think a little bit more unease, a little bit more uncertainty, a little bit more tumult is coming down the road. And sure enough, that's that VIX below 20. It's pretty short lived coming into today's show right, right about a 23 out there in VIX cash right now. That puts it ironically enough about almost exactly unched from where it was on our last show. Remember, that was a full week ago, listeners. There was no live show on Monday. VIX at about a 123. It puts it up about five handles from our last show. So vol staying frothy, vol staying juicy for the last week. VXX, a little bit shy of 16, about 1580 or so coming into showtime. Puts it off a little bit more than a handle, about 1.2 points from last show. And vol Q at about a 25 even coming into showtime. Puts it up from our last show, about two and a quarter points from this time Last week, Mr. Rock Lobster, a lot to unpack here. We got the markets selling off. We got dogs and cats living together. We have VIX. It did it. VIX did it. It got through your much watched 21 handle. Actually got through the 20 handle ever so briefly. I do have to thank you because I was planning on closing out those 21 puts like we were joking about on volatility views that I had for VIX. And then you said you were closing yours out. So I promptly did not. <laughs> and then I waited a bit and I ended up getting like a good three or four banger on. So that worked out pretty well. So I should doff my cap to you for making me delay, sir. Well, yes, because I closed some. And then I think what do we have on uh, Friday and I closed the rest of everything by uh, I left. I left some on. I think I closed the rest on Tuesday. I got like 30 cents for them or whatever. So, I mean, uh, you know, it, <laughs> I think the most I got to about 65 or 70 cents, maybe. But um, it, as far as, you know, what do we have for, well, here's another thing. Like the market's down and you notice like VXX and uh, all those products are not moving very hard, right? Um, UVXY, which is the 2X, is up 22 cents <laughs> with uh, VIX up about a dollar and a half. Um VXX is up 23 cents with a uh, mix up about a buck and a half. So as every time we people look at these products and they think to themselves, oh, my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? That's because all of those products own the most expensive relative futures I have seen since September. Just, you know, just paying up. So, um, I mean, Vol can go up. I just, uh, I mean, the the, the v, VXX and UVXY can go up for sure. But right now, VIX has to make such a huge move um, to get to move the needle that I think kind of the uh, the DAC is stacked against them, at least in the short term. Uh, yeah, and what I, what I will say, though, is how don't you find that, uh, you know, VIX is on a bit of a hair trigger because, like, we barely have, we don't even have a 1% down move today. Not even close, actually. Um, and, you know, VIX traded 24. So 
it's it's they that vol inflates really fast on the downside. Um, so I, I think there's still uh, you know there's still some uh, there's definitely some worry out there. Um, I think liquidity providers are still short a lot of contracts, um, but we're not getting that you know that real conviction sell off anywhere. So. And and I don't you know I don't know what the reason would be besides the fact that just stocks are expensive right now. Um, so there's all kinds of politics and this and that. But I mean, other than that, when you know they're trying to flood the flood the market with liquidity, I think maybe today uh, maybe Bitcoin's down. That's the <laughs> that's the only thing I can think of. You know, uh, Bitcoin uh, and crypto are not allowed to go down. So I'm not sure if you saw the memo. I, I know. <laughs> Well, I'm st- you know the the crypt the crypto thing is very interesting, right? So, I, I get I get the you know you know I you know like okay like the dollar is going to be devalued, but I mean de- devalued to what extent? You know when when a Bitcoin is worth fifty thousand bucks, like because I mean the only thing you get for Bitcoin is what you can pay in dollars. I mean I guess you could trade a Tesla for it right now. You know, like one Bitcoin is a Tesla, right? I can see that, but you know, um, not very long ago, if it come, what was it? Only five thousand dollars. So, I, I'm a, uh, like the whole thing is. I think it's a, it's a very. Um, I mean, I don't get it. So normally, stuff I don't get, I don't trade. Although I, I like the riot as kind of a little back spready stock has been kind of fun, but um, it's a, uh, it is, it's a head shaking thing. Um, I think there's also just. You just there aren't a lot of there are not a lot of bitcoins around, <laughs> so I guess there's you know companies are still mining them and people are mining them and there's but but there aren't a lot of them overall and I think a big part of this is just scarcity. Um, so we don't know what all saying and now we have how many? I mean, so my another thing is I guess I I got to check out your crypto show one of these days to get an answer. But what's the notional value of all the crypto dollars out? There? It's got to be pretty big at this point, I would think. So, well, Bitcoin um, market cap wise, Bitcoin is closing in on, on a trillion. It's nine hundred billion as of our last show, which is <laughs> which is terrifying. We were just joking not too long ago. I wonder maybe we had that poll like a month ago, not even a few weeks ago. What's going to hit t- one trillion first, Tesla or Bitcoin? It was kind of a joke poll, but it's not looking very jokey anymore, sir. No, 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 and. Listen, I don't, I, you know, I've just learned you don't get in front of things going up. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm not going to stand in front of the freight train or the back truck, right? <laughs> Even though I think it's going to stop, <laughs> the penalty is pretty big. And I think that that's a big part of what's going on with those products. Like <laughs> you can't short them. There's no, there's not a lot of willing sellers clearly. You know, because there's there's got to be some people on a ton of that stuff that are up huge dollars, you know, and they don't want to change them for dollars. That's, you know, because they think that the, you know, the dollar and everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket, which it totally can. Um, but it's a, I, it is a, you know, a lot of things I think sometimes have simple answers. And um, most mostly when it comes to trading. Uh, a lot of it comes down to liquidity and market mechanics when things do like really crazy things, right? So you can make up all kinds of reasons why Bitcoin's going up, but I think the biggest thing is just like, you know, there's a scarcity and lack of sellers, really. And that's, there just aren't a lot of Bitcoins. It's that's the same reason why when a company goes public, they don't put out the entire market cap. <laughs> uh, you know, they don't float it all at once, they just float. Four percent of the shares, or eight percent of the shares, or ten percent of the shares—something to keep that scarcity factor high. I don't, I don't think it's a whole lot different. That's what I see in this, and it, it doesn't mean it can't go to hundred thousand in the meantime. It probably can. Um, how does this thing launch into the stratosphere? Yeah, all of a sudden, you know, all of you think that okay, you know, Fortune five hundred companies take five percent of their available cash and, and and buy Bitcoin with it. You know, for transactions, maybe or something. Who knows, right? Um, and all of a sudden, <laughs> where does it go? Because who's selling it? Like, there's no who's selling the bitcoins, and that's. I think that's a big part of why this is happening. But I'm, I'd be happy for a, a listener just to explain to me what the what the deal is. You know, so um, that's um, um, that's. Uh, um, that's my anyway. That's my 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 thing. I think it's a liquidity-driven thing. 
you can have all the reasons you want. And, and by the way, we've seen liquidity squeezes, right? They can go on for a very long time. Um, so I think that's um, um, I think that's a big part of the uh, a big part of the issue. But I'm happy for a listener to square me away. Well, I'm sure they will once you invoke Bitcoin. They will they will come out of the woodwork there, sir. But you're right. That was that was kind of the old saw against Bitcoin. In the early days, and that was the concern leading up to the launch of the futures on CME back, man, that's over three years ago now, which is crazy to think that doesn't seem like it was that long ago, that it was a bit of a roach motel. You could get in, but you couldn't get out. And that, of course, continued to this inexorable squeeze that we saw out there to the upside in all things Bitcoin. And the futures came along and, hey, look at that. You could actually short them. (laughs) And that changed uh, everything for a lot of folks out there. And that, of course, was maybe a lot of people think the catalyst for the first realm of this crypto winter. Now you're right. The vehicles have improved. There are ways you can actually short Bitcoin out there now. It's a bit of a uh, hardcore endeavor. And from an options perspective, not enough yet for the, the true U.S. audience to really be able to trade. There's a few places you can go, like Ledger. Actually, you can obviously trade the options on CME, but they're pretty big, pretty beefy. They're still kind of intimidating, I think, for most of the masses out there. So we haven't seen a lot of paper on those. That'd be my preferred. If I was going to short Bitcoin, I sure as hell am not short in the future, short in the spot. It's going to go through the options. But still, it's, uh, it's an interesting beast. And you're right. At the end of the day, not enough sellers, hence the price goes up. That's pretty much the most basic Adam Smith invisible hand stuff. Uh, we could talk about here. Let's talk about what's lighting it up from an overall volume perspective out there, too, as we see if we can track down the unclest of Mike's in the deep, snowy, vast wastes of the hinterlands of Chicago here. Fix doing some paper, but not a heck of a lot. 339,000 contracts on the tape. The ADB is right around 640 out there right now spy at about 2.4 million so it's north of half of its adb out there which is just a tick over 4 million s at about 703,000. yes has been doing some more paper of late you know talking about structurally one of the products that's really suffered from the pandemic and the loss of the pits and all the issues that surrounded that is the s and it's still looking light but it's getting stronger adb is about 1.2 million that's up from it was shy of a million not too long ago the q's 550,000 the adb 975,000 and the iwm which is the flavor most of you like to sling the small caps in these days. 386,000, the ADB 748. Let's go on out to the single names. This list has been fascinating of late to watch, Mr. Rock Lobster, because it kind of changed the show to show. For a while there, we had our, our perennial top tenors, you know, your Teslas, your Microsofts, your AM. No, they're, they're still there. They're still lurking usually. No softy today, it doesn't look like. Looks like they finally fell out. But a lot of other names fighting their way into the top 10 every day. Often names... You may never have heard of. So let's dive in and see what's lightened up today here. Shall we, listeners? Cost you 225000 so a little bit lighter. It was three twenty, I think, on our last show to break into the top 10. A little bit lighter today, two twenty five. I'll get you to AMD. It, it's a perennial top tenor. It's kind of a sleepy top tenor. It's not as sexy as some of these other crazy ones we're going to talk about in a few seconds. <laughs> but it's also not a flash in the pan. It's top 10 day in, day out. So it delivers from a volume perspective. Two twenty five that gets you to number 10, AMD. Number 9, Sundial, talking about the flashy ones. It's back in there. Number nine, 235,000. Number eight, Walmart. Probably the least flashy name on our list, Walmart. You don't put Walmart and flashy together too often in the same sentence, but it's good for 237,000 contracts over there for Walmart. Number eight, number seven, talking about newcomers, talking about splashy upstarts, maybe kind of nonsensical ones. Oh, we've got CCIV. (laughs) We talked about this a little bit last week. That was the first time it broke into our lists and our scans. This is, if you're not familiar, listeners, Churchill Capital Corporation. If you're wondering, I never heard of it. I don't know what the hell that does. It's because it doesn't do anything. It's one of these SPACs that is taking the world by storm, a.k.a. special purpose acquisition companies, a.k.a. a company that goes public with no real business plan or stated purpose other than potentially acquiring something else. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a company that really has no business operations, has no revenue, no no plans to have any business or operations anytime in the near future. Just the whiff, just the hint, just the rumor that they may potentially be making an acquisition in the electric vehicle space is enough to cause all of this, listeners. As we're talking right now, CCIV is at, oh, I just had them up before. <laughs> there we go, 60 85. And if you're wondering, let's go back. Oh, let's go back a a mere five days. They were trading $31. So they pretty much doubled in the last five days. Go back a month. They were trading $17.90 on January 19. Let's go back six months, dare I say it. 
And yeah, they launched back IPO around 590. They were trading 986, pretty much unched for all of the year until pretty much the beginning of this year. Then the rumors of this potential deal with Lucid Motors, which is another EV name you probably haven't heard of. But they have one model of one car <laughs> that cost a bunch of money. They don't really sell it in many places. Uh, yet that's all it takes. The, the whiff of a deal, a company that does nothing, whiff of a deal with another company that doesn't really make any money, doesn't really do, is enough to, to cause all of this and also cause 239,000 contracts to hit the tape out there. So it's driving volume. You certainly can't argue that. But man, <laughs> you got to kind of wonder at a certain point. What are we doing here? <laughs> That's what they're trying to answer right now, perhaps down there in D.C. Number six, Riot, another one that falls into that kind of interesting category. Newcomers, upstarts. This is, of course, a blockchain name. So anything crypto related, they do some mining and everything else out there. Uh, they're a hot one. They're moving with crypto. 69.86 right now. A rough day for them today. Off eight handles, or about 10%, but good for 276,000 contracts. Number five, AMC, back in the headlines. There's some talk. Uh, maybe uh, Amazon uh, coming in. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, coming in. I thought I wasn't sure if it was Bezos kind of private capital or him, but Amazon. But it's Amazon uh, going to come in and potentially gobble up AMC, I guess, to distribute their Amazon films. Who knows? <laughs> That's good for the stock to take a nice little pop up today. And it's good for 359,000 contracts. If you're wondering, AMD still hovering shy of six bucks, 575. So well shy of its 17 to $20 range. It hit not too long ago back in the squeezy McSqueezer steam days. Uh, number four, Neo, going back to electric cars. That's all you got to say is electric cars, and bam, you're on the top 10. 394,000 contracts for number four. Number three, Tesla. Yes, number three, Tesla. 460. That's a pretty light day for Tesla. What could possibly usurp the mighty Tesla out there? Well, you know, it's the same one that did it last time, listeners. It's Palantir. Uh, 2506 is where the stock's trading. It's off two bucks or seven and a half percent, but it's good for 943 palantir has been lighting it up. I believe they had, they had earnings earlier this week. And ever since then, we talked about them on our special Tuesday rundown episode that we did out there because we felt bad for you folks. We missed you on Monday. So we did a little top 10 rundown then. And yeah, Palantir was on it then too. So Palantir has been lighting up the tape ever since their earnings earlier this week. And number one, you know what it is. It's Apple. 1.1 million contracts on the table. Not it takes a lot to unseat the big dog. It also takes a lot for Uncle Mike to miss. <laughs> to miss the option block, I'm pleased to say now we are joined by the unclest of Mike's, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud. Mr. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. How are things in the snow-laden hinterlands of Chicago, sir? All is well. Just taking a look at this uh, market coming off a little bit today. It looks like we're coming back a little bit, but um, I don't know if you'd call it an Uncle Mike type of day by any means, but uh, uh, the fact that we are down three days in a row and we're really not that far off the all-time highs, I kind of think that's a good thing. You know, probably is. Uh, of course, I think it has to be some green somewhere, not just on the vol screen, but in an actual index <laughs> for it to qualify as an Uncle Mike day. But that aside, sir, niggling about an Uncle Mike day aside, uh, what is lighting up your tape out there, sir? Well, I think right now I, what I'm looking at primarily is just the fact that uh, two days ago in pre-market, we did hit three, the 395 level on SPY. Uh, we still haven't been able to get up to that as of yet. So looking at that, VIX is rising a little bit today. Uh, of course, with the market coming down, uh, it does appear to be rising a little bit more than what it usually does on a down day. So cause for concern a little bit, but nothing major in the fact that we are down roughly a half a percent in the SPX. So uh, nothing too crazy along those lines. Uh, the thing that is probably lighting up my tape the most is that we're not really getting a lot of... We, like when we were down a lot, to, not a lot, but we were down at our lows today, we were not getting... a big uptick in treasuries. And so a lot of times when that happens, when we don't get that, when we have both a, a, a down day and the value of government treasuries along with the value of the markets, a lot of times it does have a little bit of a reversal factor going. Uh, as of now, it kind of has reversed a little bit on the equity side of it. Uh, but just in expanding on the 10-year note a little bit, uh, the fact that uh, the yield has been rising on that um, we have had a little bit more of an appetite for risk, at least from the standpoint that money's coming out of the 10-year note. So definitely watching that. And uh, we're close to halfway back to price levels. And I'm following IEF on this. We're halfway back to price levels of where we were before interest rates went bye-bye 11 months ago. 
So that's probably one of the main things that's really lighting up my tape at this point. Uh, and the fact that it feels like there's blood and carnage in the streets when we're only down a half percent on SPX. Yeah, it's one of those frame of reference things when you haven't been down in a while <laughs> and you read on the screen <laughs> suddenly seems, oh, my God, it's so awful. Everyone's just so ever since March of last year, they're pretty much used to straight up with a few breaks here or there. So any red on the screen really gets people all in a tizzy out there. Let's look really quickly. Let's look and see what's in a tizzy. I mentioned earlier in the show, we've got everyone testifying down there. In D.C., usually remotely, you got the CEO of Robin Hood. You got the good old Ken Griffin from Citadel, a bunch of others floating. They got buddy, Mr. Petterfee, floating down there, too. He's, he's made some interesting quotes. Thomas, my buddy Thomas, never one to never one to mince his words. Let me see if I could put this in my best uh, Thomas accent, what he said out there. He said, what I would like to point out here is that we have come dangerously close to the collapse of the entire system. And the public seems to be completely unaware of that, including Congress and the regulator. So Thomas never won to shy away from an interesting statement, shall I put it? But IB, of course, is one of the first to pull the trigger out there and say, yeah, no, we're dialing this back. This is getting crazy. That's kind of par for the course with them. Other brokers then followed suit. But Thomas laying it out pretty hot and heavy down there about what he thinks is uh, what's, what the problems were and what's going on. Interesting stuff. We'll have to keep an eye on this as, as all the others do their little dance before Congress. Should be interesting. Should be fascinating. It does seem like some other sides of this are starting to come to light. People initially were were very concerned. They had this narrative in their heads of it was the little guy versus the big guy, and what was going on there was great and fantastic. People like me have been around the space for a while. You know, We were looking a little bit more skeptical of this because we've seen a number of pumped and dumps and other manipulations. And call it what you will, the stock was manipulated. You can't argue that. A bunch of people doing it or one person doing it. It's still manipulation at the end of the day. Whether that's right or wrong or whatever, well, that's arguments for another day. But it was being manipulated. And how that happened and why and what should be done about it, I think, are very reasonable things and important things for Congress and the regulators to consider. So they're going to get their little pound of flesh there, too. They're going to make them squirm a little bit. That's, that's what they're doing now. But interesting stuff out there. Speaking of firms out there, interesting numbers coming out of uh, this is Bloomberg, I believe, about who's paying what out there these days. PFOF has become a hot thing, payment for order flow. This is an old topic for us. Anybody who's been in the business for a long time knows this has been around for a while. A lot of people out there, it's kind of new. A lot of people were first introduced to it back with the Michael Lewis books a few years ago. Flash Boy, that was the first time they really heard about PFOF. And uh, who's making all the money out there? Who's collecting the most payment? Well, it's Schwab, not surprising, $1.4 billion. Remember, Schwab now is TD and Schwab combined. So that's really kind of a twofer. If you split them up, it would look more rational. They'd be kind of in line, each of them a little bit more. With Robinhood, number two, closing in on, looks like about $0.7 billion out there, a.k.a. $700 million out there in terms of revenue, whereas Schwab's at about $1.4 billion. Each trade at about $400 million. Webull coming in, looks like around shy of 100 million and then apex clearing was like about 25 million or so so there it is the big dog schwab slash td collecting all the pfoff followed by robin hood they're getting they're getting a fair amount which is why some people are very angry at robin hood these days they call themselves robin hood they cloak themselves in this mystique this veneer of being for the little guy meanwhile they are collecting an inordinate amount of payment for order flow so do with that what you will. Who's paying the most? Well, th- surprise, surprise, it's Citadel, $1.1 billion, followed by Susquehanna at about, looks like close to 700 650 or so. Then Virtu, one of those high-speed players out there, at about $300 million. Then Wolverine, old-school market maker folks out there in the option space at about almost $200 million. And then Morgan Stanley at about $150 million. So interesting stuff afoot. That's kind of how the money plays out there on the street. Now let's see how the crazy options play out. It is time to unleash our Eye of Sauron. It is time. For the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by the optionsinsider.com. It's time for the odd block. everybody welcome to the odd block the portion of the show where we get weird we get wild we unleash our eye of sauron and see what it fixes its gaze upon first it's fixing its gaze deep down there in the heart of texas i wonder why i guess we'll find out in a little bit to nrg this is a name that's been on the odd block once or twice 
in the past. This is an energy company, dual headquartered in Princeton, New Jersey, and Houston. <laughs> so I think you can guess why an energy company with a headquarters in Houston may be on the radar out there today. Obviously, a lot of madness has ensued. We're going to get into it all a little bit later in TWIFO with the NAT gas market. Interestingly enough about NAT gas, when we look at the big futures trading on CME, we're not going to see, as you can hear in these reports of these crazy levels, you know, $500, $900 for these units of, of NAT gas. And that sounds absurd for a 2 or $3 commodity. Uh, but it's a very localized phenomenon. It's a very locally distributed product. You know, if you need NAT gas to, to power your power plant locally and the lines are frozen, you can't get it any other way than someone slamming it in a trunk and bring it to you. You're going you're gonna to pay through the nose for that. So it's, it's fascinating to see. And NRG has obviously been through all that tumult of late. Let's look at a quick year that's been. Actually, a year ago, they weren't that far from where they are right now. By the way, here we are, February 18th. We're pretty much two days away from the beginning of the big sell-off, which is around February 20th. Really, that's where it really started to hit the fan last year, listeners. So we're coming close to that inauspicious anniversary. But a year ago, NRG was trading right around $39.95, so about a buck and change north of where it is right now. In the great nadir, it sold off about 19 and a half bucks. It got back pretty quick. And then by June 8th, which was the previous high for this name, uh, like a lot of names, hit 38.16 again. Then it sold off again. Never really hit that level again until pretty much all this madness started happening this year. Right around January 8th, it hit 3901 again for the first time in, in close to a year. About six months, actually, from June 8th. And then it kind of kept rallying all the way up to where it was recently, 4288. Actually hit a high of 4354 intraday. And that was as a result of all this madness. Then, of course, it just taken it on the chin of late, off another 3.5% today to 3838. And what do we find out there? What a surprise, surprise, our eye of Sauron has fixed its gaze Upon some puts, in particular, the March 28 puts. These are about 10 handles out of the money going out in about a month here for 45 cents, lifting the offer, saying, you know what? We'll take those. Those are juicy. They're pretty rich. That's up almost a 100 ball. Listen, that's a 97% volatility. This guy says, I don't care. Give me them all to the tune of 9,659. Worth noting, there is some earnings juice baked in there as well. Earnings are on the 25th, so in between Feb and March expiration. So Mr. Rock Lobster, starting it off, we've got an energy name with an appropriate ticker, NRG, uh, down there in Texas where energy has been front and center for the last couple of days, as our, our meatball can no doubt attest. And someone coming in, scooping up some pretty rich 100% vol puts here for a month in NRG. What's your take, sir? Um, I, I saw those puts now. I you look at this put buying, right? And, um, um, you know, this, my, I guess my big question is what do they expect to happen? You know, buying these puts, right? You're buying the, the 28 puts They're They're 10 bucks out of the money. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It seems like some, it, it feels a little bit like a bridge too far. That's just me on this one. I mean, you know, energy companies, it's not like PG&E where they have a wildfire. Eventually, Texas will get warm and things will go back to normal. Um, and I think what this really shows, actually, to be perfectly uh, to be perfectly frank, and what's funny is they're up money on these puts. <laughs> so, I mean, the stock was, what, 40 bucks, and now it's down $2. How fast... I think just overall, how fast the vol just goes up. I mean, it, it vol flies these days. It doesn't take them any time at all to um, to really uh, just you know to fly basically. So uh, you look at this, and um, the stock was forty three bucks, and now someone's paying uh, you know forty five cents for the twenty eight puts. I, I listen. I I think this is probably a bit of a buying opportunity for because I think it comes around, you know. Um, and this is the grid operator mostly. I don't even know if it's the energy company. So uh, maybe somebody thinks there's going to be some sort of open liability or something like that. But I, I just look at this and I go, <laughs> I don't know what. They're, maybe they're buying stock with the puts. Um, I, I was trying to look and see if we could uh, get any more action, but I. Uh, so you think it's a buying opportunity in the stock? I think it's a buying opportunity to stock. I so, would you like selling these puts? Then you you are a fan. It's a hundred vol would, put. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would rather sell this put at sixty cents. It's a two percent right now. You get some for fifty five cents, and it's a two percent return for the month. Or you buy stock at 
28 bucks, and I'm just looking at the chart here. I don't think the stock has been 28 bucks. It was it was 21 bucks when we were in the Nader, right? Uh, but normally it's about a $40 stock, pays a dividend, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> it's just, I, I find this one, um, this is an interesting one as far as uh, that kind of volume goes. So somebody's looking for really bad things to happen. I just think it's probably a better sale than a purchase. I, okay. I, you want an energy stock, 2% yield till then, or you get the stock $10, $10 lower than where it is. Yeah, I'm definitely with you on that one. I'd much rather sell these than buy. So there you go, listeners. We're always talking about people bidding up call skews. Not often we talk about them bidding up put skew, but this put skew is looking pretty juicy, 100% vol. So there you go. If you're, if you're attracted at those levels of NRG and you don't mind picking up some underlying, oh, close to 10 points below where it is right now, maybe that's an attractive one for you. Keep an eye on that. We'll keep an eye on this. We'll come back to it, see how it fares as we move on to our next name. This is a newcomer, I do believe, to the odd block. This is Constellium. Constellium SE. They are a global manufacturer of, as the Brits put it, aluminum products. Uh, they are trading right now. First off, ticker symbol is CSTM. They're trading right now $13.69, off about a third of a point or about 2.3%. This is the name that over the past year, let's see how the rolled aluminum business has fared. A year ago, it was trading twelve twenty, and then it hit fourteen forty two. Unfortunately for them, they gapped up a couple of bucks right before, right before all this madness started in February. Then they took it on the chin. They got down to three dollars and ninety cents. Listeners, they they got annihilated. Wow, I guess there was no demand for rolled aluminum products. And then they slowly but surely fought their way back up. By June eighth, they topped out. At 975, and then kind of gave it back up again. We're kind of floating in the seven dollar range for a while. They threatened nine bucks once in September, but then they gave it up. And they finally got back to 10 bucks in October, and then they kind of drove past it by November. They're trading almost 13. By the beginning of this year, they're trading almost 15. And then they sold off again in late January down to about 12 bucks and change. And they have rebounded up to like 14 and a half. This is a pretty volatile rolled aluminum manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> They've been moving quite a bit and then coming off again right now where we find them 1369. Let's see what our eye of Sauron found out here. Listeners, it's going out to March, going out to the puts as well. This time, 7,000. It's also pretty juicy, certainly compared to their ADB of the March 12 puts going up for 39 cents. These were 35 cents at 50. So it looks like maybe someone perhaps drawn a bit of a line in the sand here. These were a 72 vol, so not quite as juicy as the NRG puts, but nonetheless interesting stuff. Once again, similar to the last name, there are earnings, and they are in this cycle. They're also on the 25th. So 25th, a big day for both of these names we're profiling here. So Mr. Rock Lobster, someone flipping the script here. Looks like they're selling some out-of-the-money puts here. We're looking at about a, a buck and change, a buck 70 out-of-the-money puts here. Getting not quite 100 vol, but 72 vol, and doing it 7,000 times when the earnings are the same day. So what are your thoughts here on flipping the script and perhaps selling a 72 vol put instead in everyone's favorite rolled aluminum manufacturer, Constellium? Of course, the number one thing is I just think you like saying rolled aluminum. I do. I it just rolls off really the tongue. Why you like Pun intended. One. Aluminium. You know, I think that's just your easiest, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, you know. I, I know how much you like uh, you like putting on the English voice sometimes, but I think this is a line in the sander. What do you think? Not you know a little less, a little more aggressive than we're used to seeing, but um, this has all the all the whiff and smell of line in the sand, all the whiff of line in the sand puts. So that's what I would think there. What are your uh, what are your thoughts on that? But I'm, I'm thinking line in the sand. And, you know, and they don't look, un again, unreas not unreasonable. For people that like to sell puts, I just, you know, I have a lot of students, and they sell a lot of puts. And ultimately, you sell puts if you want to buy stocks lower, um, uh, especially in a market where it is right now. <laughs> the idea of buying stocks 10 to 20% lower than where we are, uh, I don't think it's a terrible idea. And still, the vol's pretty high. So, you don't normally get that. Um, so as long as you can take delivery and you're used to it, <laughs> um, uh, 
I think that's, uh, to me at least, that's really the only way to sell puts because you got to live with what you get. And uh, But, yeah, I think this is definitely, this, this is feeling line in the sandy. It does have that feeling. We'll come back to this one as well. Speaking of coming back to things really quickly, let's go back to a trade we outlined back on November 9th of last year. This was in Spirit Airlines, uh, ticker symbol SAVE, S-A-V-E. Interesting ticker for them out there. We profiled, it looks like a call palooza. Back then, we profiled a 5,000 lot of the D22 halves going up when the stock was about 22 and a half exactly. So these were at the money calls going up on the bid for 240. The bid was 240 at 265. We saw another another bunch going up a few minutes later for a buck 75 when the stock had dropped quite a bit. The stock had dropped a buck 20 <laughs> and they were still coming in looks like to crush the bid for a buck 75 there. Similar vol levels for both. Obviously, a little bit of the the, the stock moving going to change that ball a little bit as well. So a total of 9,000 and change of these D's 22 halves going up on the bid. It seemed at the time we thought it was a bit of a call overwrite. Right? So let's fast forward to December expiration, see how these bad boys fared. It doesn't look like they fared too well. They had some, some pretty bad timing. Like I said, the stock was right around that strike on November 9th. And then you looked at it uh, pretty quickly in the initial blush, if they had taken these off <laughs> within a few days, they would have looked all right because the stock was trading on November 12th, $18.11. So they got the move that they were perhaps anticipating very early. And you know as a trader out there, if you get your move sometimes before you expect it, you're kind of sitting there like, well, what do I do with this? And uh, apparently they sat on their hands a little bit too long because the stock gapped up by November – by actually, no, so on the 9th it was trading, yeah, there – and then it got down to 18. And then a few days later, by the 24th, it was trading 23 bucks pretty much. So it was back through the strike again on the, on the other direction. And it never really looked back. By expiration, the stock closed at 27.78. So $5 and change through their strike. So it seems like if they were overriding, and then it does seem like that was the case, someone, Mr. Rock Lobster, gave up a lot of stock at the 22 half strike and effectively getting two and a half bucks more than that for that. So around 25 bucks, but still someone gave up a lot of stock below where it was trading. If you're wondering where spirit is right now, it's $33 and 33 cents. So it looks like Mr. Rock Lobster, this one was a bit of an ouchie. Would you concur? So even though they had in the, in the short term, they had a chance to take it off for some money. Yeah. Um, you know, a little, maybe you, you think they bought, this was kind of a buy, right? Right. Probably. Um, so they might have given up a lot of upside, but maybe they got a maybe a ten percent return on the underlying price. So uh, they they still are be happy. So remember, when you sell a call against stock, you kind of are going to get what you're going to get. You know, I think it's a lot. A lot of times, you can think about going through all these mental gymnastics, right? Because oh, I'm going to roll the call down and do this and do all this kind of crazy stuff. But ultimately, once you sell the call against the stock, you're, you're kind of the die is cast. Um, as far as that goes, I mean, if the call goes to zero and you can buy it back and sell another one, I think that's optimum. Um, but I think this person just got taken out. And even though they had a chance to uh, to buy their calls back, they just they let it all go away. And maybe they're happy. Maybe they bought the stock at 10 bucks, you know, or five bucks in the uh, in the uh, covid apocalypse. And they probably still did OK. That could be. We don't know where they picked up their stock. So that they could be laughing all the way to the bank. Obviously, all we see is the options leg, and the options leg obviously could have been executed a little bit better. You know what's never better, though? What never could be better, really, are, are your questions, your emails, your comments. So let's get to them, a little bit of your mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody, let's kick it off. First off, we got Kittis S. Burhane. That's a handle. And he's asking, the, we got this question so many times. Just in the last week and change, apparently everyone's got scanning for unusual activity on the brain here. This is the latest incarnation coming from Mr. Burhane. He says, how can someone find uh, unusual options activity using programs like TOSS? Or feel rogram, <laughs> feel with three E's, feel rogram that doesn't require membership 
to Flow Algo or et cetera. Also, how does Flow Algo find this information? Well, I'll say right now, I'm not familiar with Flow Algo and what they do with Feel Rogram, if that's how it's spelled. It's interesting. So I can't speak to exactly what they're using out there from an overall scanning. I've said it before. I'll say it again, what we do here. We have a kind of a, an established workflow we built up over time in the early days of the scanning world, in the early days of the options insider, there wasn't much that did this really. There were a handful of things. We were early adopters of LiveVol and liked a lot of their scanning and SKU analysis tools out there. And then, of course, Trade Alert came along well, when we did back in you know the 2007 early days there. So we were early adopters of that platform as well. And those were two we've, we've kind of used a lot ever since. We've played around with it. And I've said it before. I, I do want to do another rundown of what is available on all these platforms for you guys to use so we can have a kind of a good kind of maybe compare and contrast. I like this scanning tool. I don't like that one. Uh, so I think we're going to do some more of that to kind of speak to what you guys are, what's available to you. But unfortunately, for a lot of the good stuff out there, Mr. Berhane, it's going to cost you money. Liveball costs money. Uh, Trade alert costs money. Hopefully now that SIBO owns a lot of them, <laughs> they can maybe make some combo package for you and you can save a little bit of money on those. But uh, Trade Alert's obviously a professional grade program. They're going for a big institutional desk. So maybe the watch trading flavor doesn't have all the functionality baked in, but that might be a good way to start. That's a lot cheaper out there as well. But I, I haven't banged around with the toss stuff in a little bit since this Schwab acquisition. I don't know, Mr. Rock Lobster, Uncle Mike, can either of you speak to the toss option scanning functionality for Mr. Berhane? Yeah, I don't know if Mike wants to address it. You can go ahead. It hasn't changed a whole lot. I mean, since the takeover, as far as I can tell. But maybe Mike, Mike had, might have something different. On it. I'll take his resounding silence that the answer is no. I think he's stuck. <laughs> he's stuck in the in the snow yet again. We used to use it, obviously, a lot back for our options oddities program, as you recall, Mr. Rock Lobster. Every day, beaming into a toss, talking about unusual activity and using their tools uh, to show people how to do it on their platform. So we did. It is it is a fairly robust. Uh, a platform out there. So I, I think we need to, I don't want to spend the whole time breaking down step-by-step step how to use one single platform's scanning tools. Uh, but I think, like I said, I think a broad analysis of this is good. I think Toss, it's a good one. I mean, if you're not going to go for these other brokers or tools that I mentioned, it, it, Toss is, I should say, was one of the better ones. I've heard mixed things about it now post, post-merger, which is why I want to get back in there and check it out again. Uh, but interesting stuff. Nonetheless, uh, we got comments here from Institutional Allocator. Looks like he was going back and forth with our guest there on uh, on Volviews last week, Mr. Jim Carroll. He was asking for which shows he should listen to from a derivatives perspective. Any, if he knew any good derivatives podcasts, uh, Jim obviously mentioned us. And uh, Institutional Allocator, easy for me to say, he liked that. And he said, the option block looks awesome, he said. <laughs> so he had a big, a big thumbs up, uh, okay emoji there. And then he also said, I also subscribe to Options Bootcamp and Volatility Views as well. Nice little rabbit hole I'm going down. Hedge funds and derivative-based strategies are definitely my weakest area I'm trying to improve. Well, hopefully we can help you. We need more people out there in the institutional allocating space who actually understand these derivatives things because it's kind of a black hole for a lot of pension funds and other funds out there don't really don't really have any understanding of these products at all. So if more people out there in the institutional allocating space can come to grips with these products, if we can help with that at all, uh, so much the better. I want to touch on this one really quickly. We, we touched on it on OPR with Brian this week, but I want to, I want to do it here too because it's kind of a bit of an informative story. I want to share it with you folks out there. This comes from Jeff, Jeff Davis. It's a bit of an epic one, so bear with us here listening. He says, hey, options insiders, I have a cautionary tale about exercising put options. Here's the story. Last Thursday, I decided what the heck and bought a one-lot put on GameStop at $65. This is back, I think, a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, the bubble seemed to be popping, and I figured it'd be a fun and responsible way to play that casino without too much on the table, while limiting my downside risk. Toward the end of trading on a very rocky Friday, I found myself watching the stock bounce around in the low 60s, with my put barely in the money. Ordinarily, I've had shrugged my shoulders and closed out for what little premium was left. In this case, however, there was a fair chance such a volatile stock could drop even in the last couple of minutes of trading, vastly improving my position. So I held on through market close and the options auto exercised in my, uh, in my, just in the money. I think you know where this is going, listeners. Uh, I did not actually own any shares of GameStop, although I did have adequate funds to purchase them. 
My understanding of exercise put options is that the brokerage would secure shares on my behalf, put them to someone else's account at the strike price, and hand me the difference in cash. Uh, imagine my surprise when, before going to bed, a very early Monday morning, I saw the Toss app. I still had game my game position open, marking it anew with a loss of hundreds of dollars. Game was trading in the low 70s. I looked closer and saw the little red 100 and realized I was now short 100 shares of GameStop. Fortunately, I was able to close out at some point in before market trading to eliminate that risk, but I did eat uh, the net loss. If I had bought a higher lot count or if GameStop had spiked severely early Monday before I could take action, this could have been a lot worse. I'm wondering if you guys could elaborate on exactly how brokerages implement the exercise of put options when you don't own the underline. Specifically, how is this implementation affected by market conditions and brokerage policy? And what, if anything, can traders do to establish their exercise preferences with their brokerage. I hope this will prove helpful to others. Yours, Jeff Davis. Well, hopefully this is helpful to our listeners there. Yes, because obviously puts work a little bit differently than that. If you buy a put, you are saying you are willing throughout the lifespan of that option to sell that underlying at that strike. If you have a very volatile underlying right around expiration and it's whipping around all like GameStop was, that's why we always caution you guys to close it out because otherwise if you let it go and it's auto exercise which it will be if it's a penny in the money it will be auto exercise you are now the proud owner of a short position of 100 shares of said underlying in this case it was GameStop and you're right that is a spooky thing if you didn't know it was coming to all of a sudden be short 100 shares of a stock that was just trading 500 a few days ago that that could that could be a huge loser so you don't want to go down this road if you have these positions on for the love of God, close them. I get why you didn't want to get a little bit extra, but make sure if you're going to do this to understand the machinations behind it. Uh, Mr. M- Uncle Mike, if we got you back there, anything to add here about puts and how they actually work and what he could do to maybe mitigate this in the future, sir? Well, I think that with going into assignment, uh, I- unless you want to have either the short or the long position, you got to get out of it. Never count on something to expire worthless. Uh, if you're levered, uh, meaning if you own the option. Uh, the other thing I'd want to point out is that if you are like right at the money, and let's say that your options are like a penny by two pennies or something like that, that offer, you can call up your broker and say, do not exercise if you're long the option. Uh, Grant, I know that likely wasn't the case with anything with GameStop, but um, you have that choice should you want to do that. So uh, settlement, I, I mean, We've talked about this a lot on the show through the years. Uh, settlement, it typically doesn't end well if you go into settlement and you don't want to take the position. So, for example, if you're selling a put to get into a stock, great, go into settlement. But if you're levered and you don't have any interest in being long or short the underlying, I would highly, highly, highly recommend never going into settlement. Yeah, avoid expiration if at all possible, listeners. And, and if you can, that's a good point Mike points out there. I think Brian made it when we talked about it on OPR this week as well. You can contact your broker and say, do not exercise these. I don't want to get, but if you're going to do that, then just short them out. They'll just close them out. They really, if keeping them open, but don't assign them, I guess you can do that. So that's something else people can do. Most brokers make you call to do that. They're not going to let you do that on an online form. So bear that in mind. If you want to go to that effort, you can, but you're usually much better off. Uh, doing that. Or, of course, be prepared for the moment where you're going to come in short. That's why we say closing it out. This is from hard fought, hard won, hard learned experience, listeners. It, close them out going into expiration. There's, there's no good comes from messing around <laughs> the last minutes of expiration, particularly on a name like GameStop when the whole world is melting down. That's a good question. It's one that I think is informative for a lot of our listeners. As we keep on rolling to our final segment, It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, let's go around the block, see what each of us are watching until we get together here again on Monday. Mr. Rock Lobster, sounds like even though you got a lot of stuff going on, in your neck of the woods right now. It sounds like you're doing better than the meatball. It sounds like they have a they have a boil. They may not have wa- power. I just saw a notice. May not have power until Wednesday in Austin, and they have to boil their water after the, after the power plant. So good times. I guess you're, you're happy you're living in the compound, Mr. Rock Lobster. 
Yes. Well, I'm again, I'm quite used to hunkering down. I have multiple sources of heat. Uh, and, uh, as long as, and I've got my own generator so we can pull water out of the well. So I'm, I'm, as soon as I start the oyster farm and get some chickens, I will no longer have to ever venture to the outside world. Again. There you I'll go. Be quite happy. Then your isolation is complete. Complete and total. So I, but I feel for the meatball cause it just, you know, you're stuck in it. It's, it's amazing how fast you become a third world country when you have no electricity. Yeah, gas. that's true. It's like, it's like instant. <laughs> so like there's, there's not very many degrees of separation across humanity as soon as you take out electricity and natural gas, <laughs> unfortunately. All right. Aside from the meatballs, uh, calamities, what are you watching for the rest of the week, sir? Um, well, I'm watching this market go down, vol not going down. Um, no, notice or market go down, vol not moving up much. Um, part of my whole, uh, you know, spiel has been like this constant rally has sort of dragged the vol uh, up, and uh, you're not seeing the huge reaction from the vol futures. You're going to definitely see a little action from Cashvik. So uh, I'm keeping an eye on that and seeing uh, also if there's any more reality to this. There's been a. I thought this week was a little bit of the post-COVID again, like the little bit of action in airlines, little bit of action in cruise lines, a uh, little action in oil stocks. So uh, I've noticed in all those, the volatility has been relatively inexpensive, relative. So I'm I'm curious to see if that continues end of this week into next week. And hey, Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you, sir. What are you keeping an eye on until we can gather here together on Monday? Well, I think this weekend's pretty key uh, in that uh, in the COVID era with which we live, uh, whenever we do have some downturns in the market, we've had a lot of weekend gap downs over the course of the last 11 months. So I'm getting pretty as as hedged as I can hedge while still maintaining my discipline and being in a bullish position over this weekend. And the reason also, in addition to it being a weekend, uh, is the fact that we're getting we we are pretty close to all time highs. Uh, we have been down three days in a row, but uh, still bullish. I'm still positive deltas, but uh, just trying to uh, hunker down a little bit. And speaking of hunker down, just all of our thoughts and prayers are with uh, all of our great listeners in Texas. I know I have a uh, client slash listeners there in Texas, and um, just, we're thinking about you and hope everything gets better for you really soon. All right. And that music means, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our sojourn here. But we're not done today. No listeners. We'll be back in about exactly half an hour to talk all the madness of Nat Gas and uh, volatility and everything else going on in the world of futures options with Trifo. Stay tuned for that. You get some fun stuff pumped into the live stream in the meantime. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with the rockingest of lobster. Mr. Rock Lobster, given the power situation in Austin. I'm guessing you're going to be on Ball Views tomorrow. But uh, if folks want to check out what you guys have cooking in the land of the pit, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, go to optionpit.com and go to memberships. You could uh, join our trading legion. You can join our Vault Trade Club. You can join Robin Hood. You can join many of our Robin Hood Traders Club. All kinds of stuff there. Uh, or if you want to just, hey, you want to like learn how to trade Vol, do one-on-one mentoring with yours truly. We do all that kind of stuff, uh, although I am kind of trading sometimes during the day, so I might tell you to wait in my little chat. <laughs> but other than that, uh, we're very nice and friendly over here at OptionPick.com. So come and visit, and uh, we're uh, into this now for almost 10 years, so right, we got to be doing something right. That's all I can say. Indeed, optionpit.com is the place to go. And Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you, sir. If folks want to reach out to you in the land of St. Charles, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, you can uh, go to my website, stcharleswealth.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, at Mike Tusaw. Uh, hoping within the next week or so that I'll have my blog up and I'll be putting out extended strategy blocks on Twitter in the next couple of weeks. So uh, follow me, at Mike Tusaw. Yeah, I saw we've already got you up to, I think it was around... Uh, 50 odd followers already so a meteoric rise for uncle mike give him a follow over there on twitter he's at right around 50 right now get him up get him up even more mike tusaw no spaces or anything t-o-s-a-w on the old twitters on behalf of uncle mike and the rock lobster and indeed myself i want to thank all of you out there for downloading streaming subscribing for listening live 
And uh, we'll be back in a little bit. Speaking of listening live, I think I said we're going to wow straight through. I think we're going to actually retool a little bit here in the studio. We'll, we'll start the live stream up again in about exactly 25 minutes for Twifo. And we'll see you back here tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for Volvo Views. Then it all kicks off again on Monday, another episode of The Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.